Magnetism of volcanic deposits two, pits and lava tubes. Mark Robinson is up first. And his talk is going to be just the pits. I'm gonna... Thank you. <laughs> um, gateway to the subsurface. Oh, we have a change. Yep. Rob, Robert right. Wagner. Right. Yep. So I'm not Mark Robinson. I'm Robert Wagner. I do the, a lot of the pit research at Owl Rock. And today I'm going to be doing a brief overview of what pits are, where they are, some of the best candidates for visiting and doing initial research at, and then go over the Arnie mission, which is a mission we've done some initial research on, to look at the interior of one of these pits. So first, what are pits? They're vertical wall def collapse features on the moon. They're generally on the range of uh, less than 100 meters wide and less than 100 meters deep. And so far we've found over 300 of them. Almost all of these are in impact melt deposits inside Copernican craters, but we found 16 outside of that range. 13 Mare pits and uh, three in Highland material. And one thing I do want to point out about these is while the walls are vertical, we also almost always see a inward uh, sloping uh, apron or funnel around the rim several meters thick. So that seems to be just loose regolith that's fallen into the pit over time. So as for distribution around the moon, they're pretty widespread. We've got uh, craters with impact melt pits everywhere, and we've found Mari pits in most of the Maria. What we haven't found is Mari pits close together to each other, with the exception of this pair in northern Oceanus Procellarum, which are about two kilometers apart up near the uh, Myron crater. And these look like they're a really good candidate for a pair of skylights into a lava tube. Unfortunately, they're both filled in to the point where it's unlikely that there's any remaining opening into whatever they collapsed into. These pits along the bottom are just a, uh, some examples of uh, various interesting places we found. So in terms of science, the, there are a couple of main points so in the Mare pits expose many layers of uh, Mare lava flows up to a 100 meter cross section in the largest pits. And this would give you a natural exposure where you can look through the history of the last some million years of Mare eruptions. Also, for, from an exploration perspective, these pits provide a, a relatively benign environment compared to the lunar surface with greatly reduced uh, temperature variations, radiation exposure, and meteorite exposure, even if there aren't any deeper caves. Just getting down in these uh, steep walled deep pits can protect you from a lot of this stuff. Then, of course, it's possible that some of these do open up into caves, and those would be amazing for protection. And last, these, that you may find some materials inside these pits that haven't been exposed to space weathering effects. So you could see what the original versions of all of these minerals truly looked like. So for an initial foray into pits, here's what we'd want to see. We'd want to detailed pictures of the walls to get uh, centimeter level morphology and albedo to get some estimate of uh, what the composition might be, what the what sort of interlayer material there is, did a regolith develop between these flows. Um, ideally, you'd want to have some uh, measurement, direct measurements of composition, but that's not necessarily critical for a first foray. You want to measure the thermal and radiation environment in the pits so that you know what to expect if you eventually send humans in there. Uh, you'd want to figure out where, what exists in terms of caves, how extensive they are, and you want to find out how traversable they are. How, what sort of mobility do you need to go into one of these caves? So. There are a few challenges to pits. So on Earth, you can, if you're brave or foolish enough, just walk up to the edge of one of these, stick your head over and look in. 
On the moon, you may remember I mentioned that inward sloping funnel. That's probably loose regolith, and you are going to have some trouble creeping up to the edge without just slipping and falling in and getting a much closer look than you wanted. <laughs> then, of course, lighting is limited. These things are only illuminated for a few Earth days per month. And communications in and out can be difficult because you've got tens of, or dozens of meters of regolith between the interior and anything on the surface that can see Earth. So I'll just go over a couple of good targets for exploration. First and least convenient is the Mari Engineye pit. It's a nice pit. We've seen 20 meter overhangs on the west side. It's a Got some nice layer exposures. The only real problem with it is it's on the lunar far side, so communications are difficult. Lacus Mortis Pit in, on the northern near side has this beautiful entrance ramp, about a 23 degree slope. Unfortunately, the, we've imaged the, all the other walls of the pit, and we have no evidence that there is any sort of deeper cave system. The biggest overhang is about seven meters on the northern wall but the, you would be able to get a great layer profile walking down that slope. The Marius Hills Pit has been in the news recently. It's got the best evidence for a deeper lava tube in that area, both from gravity and radar measurements. It's inside the sinuous rill. It's definitely the best candidate for access to a cave, but from our current ima LROC images, we have no evidence that you can actually get in there Although I'll note that I recently found out that we've never imaged the west wall, so maybe there's an obvious cave over there. Finally, there's my favorite, the Mare Tranquillitatis pit. It's big, uh, fairly crisp walls, uh, about 100 meters wide, 100 meters deep. We've got great LROC imagery, including this uh, about 30 centimeter per pixel oblique view of the west wall. And so here's a map of the floor we've built from oblique images. We've imaged about 20 meters on either side, and the view is blocked by overhanging wall before we can see where the wall meets the floor on both sides. And perhaps most interestingly, you can see, the pit, you can see Earth from the floor of this pit. On the west side, especially under the overhang, there's just direct line of sight to Earth over most of the libration cycle. So that brings us to the Arnie mission, which is a mission we've uh, done some research on to basically do an initial foray into these pits and figure out what they actually look like from ground level. So from orbit, we can't tell how far back the overhangs go. You have the line of sight problem where, you're, where the pit wall blocks your vision. So you'd have to go inside to really see how far back they go. Uh, Wall layering, we recently did a trip out to Hawaii to look at some Earth analogs of these and determined that the images, or the layering in the wall is much finer than you can detect from uh, orbit, at least in Hawaii. And so close-up images from ground level, important thing for figuring out what the actual layering thickness is. And of course, floor traversability. So, the main concept is we land inside the pit. So, this lets you communicate direct to Earth without having any sort of communication relays in and out of the pit. It, it does mean that you're going to have a short mission. The maximum you can manage is about 72 hours. But for just an initial scouting mission, that's not too bad. That's about what a uh, Apollo mission did in terms of time. So during landing, you would image the walls in detail, and then as soon as you're safely on the ground, you'd relay that back up to Earth. And then the other half of this mission is we would be using basically rocket-powered drones, basketball-sized pit bots that can fly for about 90 seconds at a time, which you could send out to do, explore the overhangs closer up. And if you find more extensive cave systems, they can act as relays to get deeper and deeper into the caves. So 
There are some alternatives if you don't like trying to hit a literal 100 meter landing ellipse on the surface of the moon. So if you land outside, the pit bots can still get into the pit, but the big problems here are that you don't have a station, large stationary platform that you can stick higher quality instruments on, so your imaging is going to be lower quality. You almost certainly won't get anything multispectral, and communications are going to be something of a nightmare because you have to keep popping these things up and down out of the pits to relay stuff back to Earth. There's the more uh, traditional scenario of you land outside and send something on a tether down the wall. This would solve the problem of getting high quality imagery inside the pit, but this, these things aren't so great at caving in uncertain terrain. We can definitely see that once you get back under the overhangs, the terrain gets really rocky down there. And also, the, so this image here is, a, is our best estimate of the actual overhangs on the Mare Tranquillitatis Pits east wall based on stereo imaging of the wall. So after the first 40 meters, it would just be hanging in midair. That's an overhang. And so you'd just be dangling until you reached the bottom. So you'd get good contact. It would be easy to go down the first 40 meters, but after that, not necessarily going to be getting any useful information about the wall. Though, and one advantage of this over the uh, dropping directly into the pits, though, would be that your descender, if it's powered from the surface, could last much longer than something that's just sitting in the pit. And finally, we could use a combination of both mobility methods, using the descender to be our fixed platform for high resolution imaging and as a communication relay for flyers. This might actually work as well or better than landing directly in the pit, but it requires a lot more mass for having mobility systems on your lander. And that's pretty much all I have here. Questions? Uh, have you, uh, this is the only thing strange about, obviously these are collapse features of some kind, but why aren't they, why aren't they in, uh, show you some linear, uh, orientation? I mean, why just one in a particular place? That's really puzzling. That is an excellent question. In the impact melt pits, we do occasionally see cases where you get two or three of them in a row, or you see them in linear features. But I don't know why we never see that in the Mare pits. Maybe the lava tubes are just too deep for to get more than one pit. That's, uh, I, you know, it really is uh, hard to compute that. Unless you're dealing with a, a statistical initiation of the pit by an impact. Yeah, that's entirely and that, possible. And uh, that if you, if you don't have a, a set, uh, some more impacts to give you, uh, that ultimately mm -hmm. produce a line, you're not going to see that happen. It, it, otherwise, these tubes are, are much deeper than we think, which is also a little bit difficult to understand. These are you know, very fluid magmas, as far as we can tell, and uh, mm -hmm. you would think that the lava tubes would be, uh, uh, be more frequent than we have. In fact, you know, one of the uh, hypotheses for the origin of sinuous rills is that they're collapsed lava tubes. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of makes a lot more sense, easier to understand than these uh, isolated pits. But who knows? So, so this is probably a naive question, but um, we currently have a lot in the industry, there's a lot of, you know, uh, ground-based LiDAR units that we use to very effectively scan surfaces like the one you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. That yeah. seems like an easier way to do it than flying uh, basketballs around. Any comments? Uh, so getting stuff that's directly visible from the inside, from the floor, of the center of the floor of the pit, LIDAR is, based on your lander, is absolutely the way to go, but if there's a, if you have to go down to get to the pit, which is very likely because this is a uh, debris infill creating the floor, you're probably going to have to go down to get to any caves. For that, you'll need to have some sort of flyer or crawler. Last question. Uh, 
kind of goes back to the formation of these uh, based on the 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 ground distance between the lunar surface and the ceiling of, of the overhangs, um, how thick are they relative to kind of earth analogs and are there any good earth analogs that show that similar type of structural uh, thickness? Good question. The, so we've looked at collapsed pit craters in Hawaii as possible analogs for these. They do have similar vertical walls, what they, though those particular features aren't actually collapses into lava tubes, they're tectonically formed uh, chimneys, basically. Uh, so I, I don't know what sorts of analogs there are for skylights through 40 meters of rock. There are, in, there are a few in limestone, but I'm not, nothing's coming to mind in basalt, so. Okay. All right, uh, next talk I see on the list is exploring pit craters to understand Lunar Maria, but I don't see Laura, Cr oh, she's presenting remotely. They don't tell me anything right now. Um, okay, uh, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. This is working much better than yesterday. Awesome. Um, all right, so uh, Laura Kerber is going to um, talk about exploring pit craters to understand the Lunar Maria. Um, we're trying to do like 12 minutes and then three minutes for questions, something like that. That works. All right, take it away. Great. Okay, so um, jumping off from where Robert was talking about, um, I've been doing this experiment where pretty much everyone I meet, I try and convince them that we should go on a mission to a lunar pit crater. <laughs> and so if it's someone at the grocery store, like a hairdresser, you know, a acupuncturist or something like that, and I kind of see what uh, makes their eyes light up. And it's definitely this picture on the left is the big key. So the way the conversation usually goes is, um, you know, I say that we found a hole in the moon. And, uh, you know, the, the hole leads into this enormous underground cavern, perhaps. And, um, you know, then they say, like, oh, you know, what's down there? And I say, I don't know what's down there. Like, nobody knows what's down there. <laughs> so, so that's kind of what I've found that like, people are really interested in. They're, they're kind of like, what, is there like an artifact down there? Are we going to find a city or like a monolith or something? And then, you know, I kind of suggest like, Laura, well, maybe we could find more rocks. No, that was just a <laughs> so, um, so, but, you know, when I first saw these pits, um, what really caught my eye was not even the cave, which is very interesting, but on the right-hand side when I saw that section. And I was thinking to myself, wow, like how long have I wanted a section, like a drill hole through the Mara deposits, and then here God has delivered one to us as a pre-drilled hole through the Mara deposits and in a bunch of different locations. So that's very exciting. So in this presentation, I just wanted to take you through all the interesting things that I think you could do in this pit and then take a minute to talk about a way that we were thinking about to, to go about doing that. Um, so to sort of start at the top, here's the, here's the regime. I have, there's the Marius Hill pit on the top here, and then there's the Tranquilitatis, oh, here's the Marius Hill, here's the Tranquilitatis, and then here's sort of a schematic diagram of what all these um, uh, distances are, and this, these are for the Marius Hill pits. Uh, so starting at the top, you see this sort of, you have a regolith, and like Robert was talking about, there's the regolith funnel sort of around the regolith coming in, and the Marius Hill, it's a lot more vertical towards the top, like uh, 4 to 10 meters of regolith, and then on the Tranquilitatis, it's kind of more sloping. Um, but if you had like a microscope, kind of like the Molly microscope on Curiosity, um, this is an image of the sand that we found at Curiosity with a one millimeter scale bar. And here are some uh, examples of lunar regolith of different kinds. This is actually a regolith simulant, um, but at the same scale. So you could see all these different um, beautiful pieces of the regolith as you were going down. And the more vertical the regolith is, um, the more likely you'd be able to see layers. You'd actually be able to see sort of a cross section through the regolith, especially if you're able to sort of dig through it a little bit. Um, otherwise, you just kind of, it's a little bit more mixed up if it's all stuff falling into the pit. Um, here's another example of at the same scale. 
So um, the, then, okay, so as you're going down through the regolith, very interesting, looking at all that stuff, all the stuff that you could do at the surface, you know, these sort of SKGs that have to do with the particle size distribution of the regolith, you can try and answer. Um, you could answer those anywhere, but then you sort of get the 3D as you're going down into the regolith. And then you hit this most very interesting, which would be the regolith bedrock interface. And so I think I'm very interested in this because if you think about the mega regolith in the highlands, we think, okay, there's this huge mixed up impact garden regolith, and underneath there's this intensely fractured part that goes way deep into the moon. And in the Mare, since it's more recent, you'd expect that to not to be quite as developed. You have, you know, meters of regolith, and then you have a fairly intact basalted bedrock. But you'd imagine it would have started that process sort of to become fractured, and you could look at that interface and see do we see a bunch of tiny fractures or big fractures, and how are you just kind of mashing up that very top surface of the uh, uh, basalt, or is it going several layers down? Uh, you could look at that directly. Um, the other thing that you could look at is how the composition of the regolith compares to the lava underneath it. And so we've always taken, okay, here's the basalt that we found lying on the surface, here's the regolith, the composition is different. You might have in the regolith 20% of stuff that comes from somewhere else, exotic, maybe from the highlands. Um, this would be a chance to directly compare a regolith right above it to the, to the bedrock right below it. What is the compositional difference as far as um, minerals or elemental composition? Uh, then once you got down in the lava layers, uh, this would be really exciting for me because we talk about the Mara as flood basalt. And so we think of it as really kind of super thick, maybe tens of meters thick basalt coming across the surface really low viscosity. They kind of, you know, in the case of the sinuous row, maybe they're coming flood-like or a turbulent manner. Um, but we found that in flood basalts on the Earth, um, a lot of them, there's a lot bigger bowl that for inflated flows and complex flows. And so you could get right up against the surface of those flows and you could say, am I seeing pahoy hoy? Am I seeing ah uh ah? -uh? Am I seeing like an inflated flow? Is it 30 meters thick because it flowed that way? Or is it 30 meters thick because it was inflated? And so there's all sorts of little things that you can look at at the surface of the lava, like these sort of crusts over here, and, and, and this is an empty tube, and here's the filled tube. You could see all of that in cross-section. And so I wanted to give you an idea. This is an, that Robert was talking about those pits in Hawaii. This is an example of one of those pits in Hawaii. Um, this pit is actually about the same depth as the Marius Hill pit, and about the same radius as well. And you can see just barely this tiny person wearing red. Uh, up here on the top. This is actually enormous. And so, and, and if you're at the Marius Hills, about um, half of this, a little more than half of this would be layers, and then you'd have the void space down here. So once you were looking really up close at those basalts, uh, you would get a chance to see, okay, do we have any vesicles? Do we have any phenocrysts? This is, again, at the same scale that I was showing those other things from the Molly images. So you kind of get way up close and personal with this basalt. And it would give you Something that we haven't had before, which is that the critical context. Essentially, if you're taking the elemental composition of a basalt and you're looking at the mineralogy, are you looking at the mineralogy and chemical composition of a basalt where you've had a deep kind of lava lake type thing going on and all the crystals have settled to the bottom? Um, is it differentiated as it's been flowing? Um, as we take sort of float pieces of basalt from the surface, they could all be from one basalt, but they'd look a lot different um, because they're all from different parts of the same lava flow. So this would give us a chance to look at not only uh, differences within one lava flow, but differences between a whole stack of lava flows. And so you could see if there's a lot of inter-lava flow variability and also if there's a sequence that the lava flow changes composition over time. So once you get down into the lava tube, uh, as Robert was talking about, you'd have pristine lava on the floor and walls. You'd be able to look at the geometry of the lava tube. People have written papers about how much of a void space can be supported beneath, beneath the lunar surface. And they, they calculate, you know, uh, void spaces that could be absolutely enormous. It would be interesting to see what's the geometry of this tube. Um, and then also as a precursor for human exploration, as Robert said, protected from radiation and micrometeorites. And um, for the Mare Hill pit, it would have a balmy temperature of about minus 30 C year round. So the nice thing about that is that it's stable. And so you design all of your engineering for this one temperature, and you wouldn't have to worry about it changing all the time and different things becoming hot and cold and stretching, uh, which can be a problem. 
So if I had to choose one of these lava tubes, um, one of these pits to go to, uh, Robert did a good job of explaining all the different ones. There's some that don't seem that possibly don't have a, an entrance to a pit. And then there's other of them that don't have as good walls, essentially. And then I am a big fan of the Engineite pit, but it's on the lunar far side. So out of the Mario Hills pit and the Tranquilitatis pit, there's benefits to both of them. Essentially, one big difference is the thickness of the section. In Marius Hills, it's about 23 meters. In Tranquilitatis, it's more like 40 meters. So you get double the amount of section that you could look at. Um, conversely, the verticality of the regolith cone near the Marius Hills, it's a little bit more vertical, so you might have a better chance of getting a more clean cut down through the regolith. Um, and then the context is important, so um, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, but then also the possibility of a large tube. So there's been some evidence from the gravity and from uh, the clean radar, Junichi Hariyama, talking about how it seems like there could be a large pit near the Maria Hills. Um, but if you look at the Tranquilitatis pit, you can see up to 20 meters back there. So you know that at least you have 20 meters to go. Uh, you can already tell from space. And the thing about looking, kind of focusing a mission on the layers is that you can see the layers already from space. You don't have to say, I hope that there's a tube there. You can focus all of your energy on the layers, and then if there is a tube there, it's a huge bonus to your mission. So here's some of the context. Here's the Mari, uh, Mari Tranquilitatis pit. The nice thing about the context here is that it is kind of a standard Mari. So take one of the circular um, Mari basins, put a drill hole into it 100 meters deep. That's what you get. Uh, there's not a lot of other things around um, this area, and so you get kind of a standard flood basalt, which would be interesting not only for the moon, um, but interesting for other sorts of standard flood basalts you find on Mars or Venus or other places. You get to experience how a standard flood basalt works. And you also already have um, some samples from uh, Apollo 11. Uh, so that would be interesting as well. And the other spot here at the Mario Hills, Oceanus Prothalarum. The interesting thing about this is it's in an area that we haven't been sampling. And then also, it's in an area where you have the Maria Hills, which seems to be some of the most viscous types of lava on the moon. And then you have, it's right inside a sinuous rill. So here's a picture of where it is inside the sinuous rill. Let's see right here. Right there. And so you might have a chance of sampling both the most viscous lavas and the least viscous lavas there on the moon. That would be sort of the end member case. And of course, the Maria Hills is just interesting in general. You could just go there not even go into a pit and drive around. You'd have a lot of interesting things to look at. So, of course, I wouldn't tell you about all of this stuff if I didn't think that we could actually get there. The issue is how to get access to this. Um, so at JPL, we have a rover that's called the Axle Rover. And when I met the guy, Ethan Esmith, who makes this rover, I just my eyes lit up because I said, oh, I know exactly what I want to do with this rover. Um, it's, what happens is the way it works is that you have a lander on the surface. It has solar panels, has your communication dishes. Um, you have a tether that's connected to your rover. Your tether provides your communication. It provides the means by which you don't fall down into a pit, as Robert was talking about. And it provides um, your power. And so this, we already have a rover that works. We fielded it in Arizona. Um, we, so I put this in this picture of, this is the Lunacod control room. So this guy is controlling Lunacod on the moon with a joystick. It's, right now, we have uh, Axel hooked up to an Xbox control. So if you've been practicing your Xbox games, then you're, you'll be ready to help us drive um, this Axel rover on the moon. And the way this works is that all the instruments are in this instrument bay here. And then they come out, and they deploy on the surface. And you can rotate the instrument bay independently of the wheel around it. So you can use the, actually the wheel. If you lock the other wheel, you can use this wheel to dig holes and sort of uh, dig into the regolith. And then you can use this. You can have a bunch of instru instruments that look at the exact same spot within about a millimeter. And then you have cameras to see kind of where you are. And, and you can use that. This works. Not only you can you go up and down the face of this wall, but if you're just dangling in the middle of space, that's fine too. You just come down uh, to the surface and then continue roving on into, the, into the whatever cave might be there. And so if you put all of this together into a mission, we've called it Moon Diver. It's a discovery class mission. And you know a tagline for the lunar community diving into the history of the lunar mare. So it's it's a moon diver because it's diving into the sea of lunar history. And um, so essentially, what I like about this idea 
is that it has a very simple payload, all the things that I was just talking about, I would say, you can do all of this and more uh, <laughs> with a simple payload, uh, basically context cameras, microimager, uh, a, a device for elemental composition like an APXS, and maybe a shortwave infrared spectrometer. And so um, you can do all of this. Uh, most of our instruments are happier in the dark than they are in the light, so bring a flash with you for the cameras and then keep your detectors pretty cool in the dark. And then, um, you know, you can go to the moon. I think it would be uh, really interesting. And then at the end of the mission, of course, you would go down to that cave and you say, you know, I don't know what we're going to find down there. And nobody knows what we're going to find down there. And I think it would be very exciting. Thank you. We have time for one or two quick questions. One question. It's just a question from a technological point. Um, Pete Humphreys, AMS Inc. Um, once your thing breaks, wouldn't it be nice to have a module, a habitation, where you could repair it in situ or test some of your regolith in situ that where you had the technology available to you? Okay, that's just from, I'm an engineer, I'm not a geologist, so, yeah. Um, uh, would you repeat your question, sorry? Okay, wouldn't it be uh, like good to have a workshop where you could bring your regolith back and actually test it in situ and do the sampling in like a hab or something like that? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think that would be really interesting. Actually, this particular, um, rover. Right now we have a drill on it made by Honeybee and the drill takes these little powder samples. It can take either powder or core samples. And so when we were thinking about this mission originally, we were thinking, oh wow, wouldn't it be cool to take you know, a bunch of different samples as you go all the way down and then bring them up and then, okay, you can't afford to fly them back. Maybe somebody else can fly them back later. Um, but then we realized that really how much we could do by using in situ instruments. Um, but I think as, as you evolve, this, this platform, you can fit a lot of different things in here and as a huge payload bit. You could see how big it was when I, you ha I had it in the back of my car. And so you could put a lot of different things in there. You could take samples and you could preserve them. Uh, you could cache them, you could bring them back. Um, it's really quite evolvable. If you didn't want to send your, your astronauts down into this region right away because you thought it was dangerous, you could send this device down. Penny? Um, hi, Laura, this is Penny Boston. Um, one of the things that uh, Carolyn Parchetta had a lot of trouble with with VolcanoBot uh, was snagginess as it went down, uh, you know, in connection with the wall. And I think Axel is a really cool little robot, but, you know, as a lifelong lava tube gaver, <laughs> all I can think of is continuously getting hung up. So I know that, you know, this is a notional conception for, uh, for the mission, but I think that that type of robot needs a lot of rethinking in terms of actually access. So not intrinsically a problem with lowering a device, but it has to be able to get unstuck um, because we cannot yeah. see the roughness of the walls even from you know, the, the uh, wonderful imaging we currently have. Yeah, so I was out in the field actually with Carolyn a bunch of times when she was right. getting volcano spots stuck. And we were putting it down a fissure and essentially what would happen is she would get stuck on like a ledge and then she wouldn't be able to kind of come off the ledge or conversely if she was coming up there would be a le ledge and she'd get stuck underneath the ledge. Yeah. And so the advantage is one of the, the things that Volcano Bot didn't have at the time is that it didn't have very strongly actuated motors and so the motors weren't strong enough to turn the wheels so that you could try and like uh, use the wheels to disengage yourself from that ledge either coming from the top or coming from the bottom. And so one advantage that Axel has is it's just larger in general than VolcanoBot is, and so it has big, huge wheels, and it sits further off, off of, the, of the wheels. And so if you were coming down and you kind of hit a ledge, then you'd be able to use your wheel and, we, you know, strong enough motors to kind of get you off that ledge. And then suppose maybe you went underneath an overhang and you couldn't come back, you got stuck. That's actually fine. We don't have to come back up. We just kind of come down, and then that's it. And then if we went into the tube, you know, given how many tubes you've seen and I've seen, 
you'd probably get stuck eventually in one yeah. of those tubes. They're crazy in there. I mean, unless you're really lucky and you got a really smooth tube. Um, but it's okay. You're not, at that point in the mission, it's just extra stuff. You're kind of going and seeing what's happening in the tube, and if you get stuck, that's fine. Okay, so a one-way trip is fine. Okay, thanks. Right. Thank you very much, Laura. We have to move on now. Um, the next talk is by Pascal Lee, Flowless Crater, uh, exploring candidate lava tubes and skylights near the Lunar North Pole. Uh, good morning. Thank you for staying. Uh, so the talk I'm going to give this morning uh, is about something that I'm not 100% sure is a lava tube skylight or a set of lava tube skylights. That's why the title of the abstract was cautious. We, we said candidates. But um, I actually think that the context, the geology context, the size, the, uh, what we are given in terms of the image, imaging available and the illumination, geometry, uh, uh, and also the shape of these of these pits, these I mean the depressions at the very least, uh, suggest that that they actually are likely to be skylights. So I will uh, show you some imaging, and hopefully what this will trigger is a desire to actually acquire more imaging somehow at higher resolution. Um, uh, but there's an inherent difficulty in imaging pits at high latitudes, and that is the illumination is at a grazing angle. So you are not going to see and should not expect to see the bottom of the pit. Uh, and, and so now you're left with uh, essentially context to, and, and some out external characteristics to, to sort of make a call. Um, OK. But before I begin, I have one slide that I inserted just because I'm going to volunteer three uh, key recommendations based on discussions I've heard today and, and uh, especially yesterday. Uh, next slide, I control that, okay. So, in my humble opinion, to have a, an effective lunar exploration strategy moving forward, we really need to consider three things. Uh, and that's in light of the fact that, you know, we have all these interesting sites we want to go explore and not just touch on, but explore in depth. Antoniati, uh, Schrodinger, and many other places. So, um, if having humans back on the moon is a given, we really need to think about setting up a fixed surface infrastructure. Constellation actually considered a mobile surface infrastructure. I thought that was really a risky thing, and it's not very practical, especially if the infrastructure expands. Uh, but if you look at proven examples of where this has really worked well, having a fixed surface infrastructure, what that does mainly to you uh, as a scientist who has a long-term interest uh, to, to explore the moon uh, is that you have programmatic, programmatic robustness. You have something that is there in place. It exists, it can grow, and it, it is not on an orbit that's decaying. Uh, so uh, you have an infrastructure that you can use. We've, you've used this paradigm essentially in Antarctica with all our research stations since the International Geophysical Year. Uh, even at the Houghton Mars Project in the Arctic, our little project has decided from day one to invest in a local surface infrastructure, which is in place and permanent, and that actually has allowed us to, to weather through leaner years in funding, uh, but it still exists. And that's how cities become cities. You set up an infrastructure and, and eventually you build it and they, they, they will come. Uh, so from my perspective, I think that we really need to be thinking, even in terms of our scientific interests at a lunar base, and because that conjures a big size, I, I like to call it a lunar station. The second key thing is that when you look at a, an Antarctic station, we tend to focus on the fact that it's a physical base. But what really creates the infrastructure that's an exploration capability is the fact that it's a base combined with a mobility system, a, mobi a mobility architecture. You have, for example, at McMurdo, not just you know, a, a base, you have vehicles to get you around. You have snowmobiles for short range. You have helicopters to get you to the dry valleys and short hops. You have twin otters for light, longer range flights. You have C-130s for big cargo transport. And what you do with McMurdo, you're not exploring just the vicinity of McMurdo. You, are, you're, you have access to the entire continent. So the, the point about this fixed infrastructure is that it's really an outpost. It's, it's something that the military do when they want to conquer a territory. 
uh, it's all in the art of war. You set up a, you know, a beachhead, and from there you conquer. You need a logistical outpost, a base, to be uh, effective at, uh, but not alone, not just the base, plus the mobility system, and then you can c conquer territory. Now, if we are going to have a base somewhere, then we really have to think about long-term sustainability of the base. And as long as this issue of whether or not the water is uh, going to be extractable to the point where it's actually a resource, Alan Berenstein made a good point uh, yesterday about saying that water is like gold in the paint. Well, he didn't say that, but I often say that. Water is like gold on the moon. It's like gold on, in the paint of your wall. There's some gold, but it's not, extra, it's not a resource. It's not extractable. There's not enough of it to make it worth extracting. Okay, so the key thing here is to f determine if the water that we do have, wherever it is on the moon, is actually in sufficient concentration to be extractable. Uh, and if so, where, where is it? And where's the optimal place to go? So this is essentially has been the motivation of uh, my, the study I'm going to present here. Uh, we are aware, of course, of the uh, water deposits at the poles. We are aware of uh, Robert Wagner's and Mark Robinson's work on skylights and on these uh, pits. And I actually was really inspired by that. I was also surprised that none were reported in the uh, polar regions at, at high latitudes. And I think, obviously, it's an imaging limitation. But I nevertheless went through the exercise of combing through hundreds of uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter narrow angle camera images. And uh, I'm going to tell you about what I saw. So uh, I think we can see we've identified pits uh, near on the floor of Philolaus Crater. So that's a crater that's uh, at 72 degrees north, uh, about 550 kilometers from the North Pole. And so uh, once you're there, you're going to be uh, in a sort of a domain that we've never explored either with humans or even uh, robotic spacecraft uh, on the surface, at least. Uh, this is the crater. It's 70 kilometers across. Uh, it's 3.4 kilometers deep uh, from its uh, highest terrace wall walls. And it's a twin peak complex. There's no clear central peak. There are some uh, two main peaks in the, in the southern and eastern part of the, of the crater, it's a little bit off center. Now, you notice already that towards the uh, northeastern side of the crater here, there is a, what I'm interpreting up front as an impact melt deposit, but I think that's pretty reasonable. It's sort of a, a, um, a relatively smooth surface. Now, the age of Philolaus, it's among the large Copernican period craters. It has a system of radial rays that are still identifiable across the moon. Uh, and so this basically means that it's a relatively young, large impact structure uh, on the moon at 1.1 billion years. It's also outside of the perimeter of the Imbrium Basin, but it's right at the edge of it, actually. And so it's possible that when Philolaus uh, happened, it actually um, uh, excavated the uh, Imbrian Basin deposits along with whatever was, was at the site uh, deeper down. Uh, this was a slide contributed to me by Robert Wagner, which is a digital elevation model, showing you that if you actually go from the very bottom of the crater, which is the smooth area we're interested in, all the way to the white-colored uh, higher terrain here, you have a, a delta Z of 5 kilometers. So there's considerable relief there. Uh, but, um, uh, and I have not spent time looking at ways to get out of the crater if you were inside uh, with, a, with a mission. But uh, again, uh, incidentally, this, uh, this finding that I'm reporting uh, happened in late November, so uh, there you go. Uh, all right, so this is Phil Laos with a vertical view looking down. Uh, north is to the upper left. And the next slide that I'm going to show you is essentially what's in the box. You're going to have to rotate it downwards to the right, and then you'll see the, the, the area covered in the next slide. So we have here the uh, eastern uh, peak, uh, along with the relatively smooth floor of the crater. But you notice immediately there's a network of winding, meandering uh, grooves or channels. Uh, and of course, these would be described normally as, as sinuous rills on the moon. All right, now we're going to zoom in further to this particular location. 
and you will see that some of these sinuous rills actually are expressed as, in some cases, more like uh, chains of depressions. Uh, and so it's, it's not uh, sort of, uh, we're not looking at Hadley Rill here, we're looking at things that are uh, not necessarily very deep uh, and in some cases might not be collapsed at all. Okay. So of course these sinuous rills are interpreted as, as, a, as a network of, uh, of lava tubes, uh, many of which would be collapsed and some, some maybe not yet. Now zooming in further, we get uh, to this. So these are three pits that actually remain, at least in the central part, permanently shadowed regardless of the illumination that has been available in the NAC images that, that I've seen, some of which were sent to me by, uh, by Robert Wagner. And so I really want to uh, credit him for, for his help here. But uh, in any case, these just remain um, uh, dark throughout the, the lighting uh, that we have. And I'm going to show you in the next slide essentially the area covered by the highest resolution NAC image that I'm aware of uh, of these three particular pits, although there are a few other candidates uh, farther out uh, on, on the uh, deposit. Now, uh, note one thing. If your eye is inclined to tell you that, for example, at pit number one, what you actually see is look, looks like the rim of a crater uh, with the lighting coming from you know, above, if you look more carefully, the craters are actually lit from below. The lighting, uh, the ins insulation here is coming from the south, obviously. So, so uh, what you should realize is that the, what might look normally like a, like a sort of a lit, sharp crater rim is actually probably the beginning of the vertical section of a, of a pit. All right. So this is the... Uh, I'm going to show this to you in a little bit better. Okay, and we're talking about this pit here. You see, this this is not actually a raised rim that's lit from above. It's actually a a surface that's facing uh, south or southwest that's being lit from from that direction. Okay, and uh, on pit number three, you actually see really well this. Uh, funnel collapse zone that accompanies many of these pits. This is sort of a sloping um, terrain into, into the pit area. And you see that as well uh, right here. So the interpretation here is that this is what we're looking at. Permanently shadowed pits. Uh, at Philolaus, the solar incidence angle is, is greater than at, at any time of the year than 66 degrees. The skylight floor is generally never directly sunlit. Now, this is particularly intriguing. The temperatures at the very surface are relatively benign, somewhere between 200 and 240 Kelvin. This is divine data. Uh, nighttime minimum temperatures at the surface are about 80 Kelvin. The thermal skin depth, the diurnal sk thermal skin depth is just about 10 centimeters or so, so uh, that doesn't do much for you. But even the annual thermal skin depth is about you know, half a meter or, or 60 centimeters. And so, uh, the, the average temperature in the rock fraction near the surface beyond about a meter or so is, is going to be roughly uh, 120 to 140 Kelvin. Okay. Now, the cave itself and the cave surfaces themselves might be actually cooler than that because they will radiate whatever heat they have, and so this might represent an upper limit of the temperature of the cave walls. Uh, neutron spectrometry data don't show any particular abundance of water, water ice uh, at the scale of Philolaos, but that's not really telling you much. You wouldn't expect really a signature at the scale of your, of your lava tube entrance. Uh, even updated data that has refined revolution, resolution doesn't really show you much. Okay, so uh, no particular uh, sign that there's water near there. Um, on Earth, however, if you go to lava tubes that are in cold regions, this is a view of the inside of uh, loft Helier lava tube in Iceland, you can find massive deposits of ice. And if you notice, there are stalactites and stalagmites of ice, and so uh, I'm not suggesting that the same process would fill a cold lava tube on the moon uh, with ice. On the Earth, this is clearly water that's infiltrated from above, so it's precipitation water, and once it enters the cool cave, it just freezes. And so you have these, these formations. But what this illustrates is that the lava tube is a is a microenvironment that is isolated from the thermal and environmental conditions that are outside the lava tube. And so 
you might expect to, to have the same benefit in the lava tube uh, at Philolaus. Uh, so comms would be good. We see the Earth from the floor and from the entrances to, to these, what, from these uh, candidate pits. This is the view that we would have from, from the area of the Earth. Uh, this is the mission that I'm proposing. Uh, so of course I'm jumping ahead here because <clears throat> we need to do other reconnaissance ahead of time and in particular confirm whether or not they are, they are, they are actually pits, I mean actually skylights of lava tubes. But uh, the ultimate mission that this would prepare us for is of course to explore lava tubes and caves uh, and skylights on Mars. Uh, so I'll just let this play, but um, we can end here, and this will just be a flyby of the area, and it's silent. Okay. Um, so we're bumped right up against our, uh, our break time, but what I might suggest is if uh, Robert wants to come back up and Pascal can stay up here for a minute, and I don't know if Laura is still online, we can maybe ask a few questions, start a discussion, and if uh, you want to uh, use the facilities or grab a coffee uh, before, the next, uh, bef before the next session starts, then we can do that as well. Carly, you want to start us off? Uh, yeah, I'm glad we had time for this. Um, are there any techniques or approaches that can be used, say, on a rover like EM Sounding to look for the extent of these underground caverns? Um, I'm just not familiar with what the technology can do yet, and I know you guys have thought about it. Yeah. Uh, gr gravimetry can theoretically get the extent of any lava tubes in the area, to, at least if they're fairly large, as they're likely to be in the case of the large mare pits. Uh, and can oh, I say no. something? Sorry. Yeah, sure. I was just going to say um, that, uh, so if you can imagine what Celine has been doing with its radar from orbit, if you could have a ground penetrating radar on a, either you'd have like a low flying thing that would come across with the radar, or if you had a surface thing with sort of a ground penetrating radar, you had that radar that was on the um, Chang'e 3 lander, and it could see down at see a bunch of lava layers in the surface. So it's possible that you could not only see void space, but you could also map some of the layers, um, depending on what wavelength you chose for your radar. So sort of um, the lean's kind of right at the edge where it can see, it can kind of see things if they're really large. Um, but if you, have, if you could get closer, you could have higher power. If you could get on the surface, then you could do a lot better, I think. Oh. I want to add quickly to that. Uh, radar typically uh, probes to a depth of about 10 radar wavelengths. Uh, and so if you use a, a shorter, more compact radar system, you will only be able to probe to, to relatively shallow depths. If you want something that's going to reach uh, into the depth of the, the roof, for example, of the lava tube, you're going to want a system that operates at about, uh, you know, t I mean, if it's, say, 100 meters deep or a few tens of meters deep, you want a system that's operating maybe at 5 meters uh, wavelength, okay, a radar system. So thankfully, the width of the cavity is greater than five meters, so you will actually see if there's a dielectric contrast uh, between the, the rock and the void of the cave, you will, you will see uh, by doing transects across these lava, these uh, rills, you will, you, you will see probably a cavity. Yep. Um, I wanted to share one little tidbit of news and then actually ask a question. The tidbit of news is that um, there's a NIAC funded phase one to look at um, they're calling it seeing round corners. Uh, so a reflected light, um, you know, effort to essentially do a CAT scan, basically. And I think it's really promising. So we may have a new tool in the kit uh, besides, you know, direct imaging sometime in the future. We'll see how that develops. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, pursue was this whole issue of uh, what can we expect for volatile trapping within cavities? And I was, uh, I'm not a lunar scientist, I'm a cave scientist and astrobiologist, but I was intrigued yesterday by the volatile session where uh, it was clear to me that uh, the volatile cycle, the water vapor uh, cycle on the moon is so poorly understood, I had no idea. Um, there is a single paper that I know of modeling 
some of these questions for the Martian case by Kai Williams uh, in 2010. And I don't think a similar study, a modeling study, has been done for volatile trapping on the moon, and maybe it's time that that uh, get pursued. Um, one of the things that we know from the studies of ice caves here on this planet is that uh, the retention of the water vapor and the deposited ice is intimately uh, dependent on the minutia of the geometry rather than the bulk conditions. So I think it's a very tough problem, but I think it's very important uh, to pursue. And I just wanted uh, to throw that out there and, and get your response to that. Um, I'm sorry, I've been told by people higher up the food chain that we have to cut it off right okay. here. <laughs> but I think that's a, that's a really good point to, to end on, and uh, maybe you guys can talk a little bit later. Yeah. All right, thanks very much. It was a good session. <laughs> I have <a> <laughs>